what's going on everybody my name is Eli and welcome back to my channel for people that are new here I'm a first year dental student at Boston University at the Henry M Goldman School of Dental Medicine I decided to do a video today with three of my classmates who are all recipients of the HPSP scholarship um, we all felt it was important to disseminate information about the scholarship uh, talk about different things regarding the scholarship and joining the military and we kind of felt like it was in, important to get this information out and who better to tell you about than three people who are currently experiencing what it's like to receive this scholarship and you know the commitments along with it so without further ado I'll introduce you and then they'll introduce themselves so Liam, Ben, and Iman so Liam you can introduce yourself first Hi, I'm Liam, I'm from Barnstable, Massachusetts I went to the College of Holy Cross and I'm a first year at Boston University, Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Hey guys, my name is Ben Belvance. I'm from Southeast Mass, Rehoboth. Uh, I went to College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, MA for my undergrad, and I'm here now as a first year student at BU Dental. Well, like these two guys, uh, I'm also from Massachusetts, and I'm a first year at BU Dental. My name's Zeman. I went to university in Canada, though, at McGill. All right, so we have kind of a, um, it's kind of like an interview set up, but it's really going to be a conversation. I'm just kind of going to moderate the conversation between them. I sent them a few questions beforehand that they can consider as like talking points, but essentially they're going to be talking about the scholarships, what comes with the scholarship, um, and kind of how they went about getting the scholarship, and all different kinds of things. So um, first question we're going to start off with is, how did you guys find out about the HPSB scholarship? Yeah, so I can run with that. Yeah, so as anyone who's applying right now is definitely uh, noticing the debt and the cost of dental school is on the rise. It's very substantial, and a lot of people really stress about that during their time in school, about how they're going to find housing or pay for their books, gear, equipment, uh, just their normal tuition. So during my time in the application cycle, I did some searching on the internet looking for opportunities on how I can fund dental school and I found this opportunity from the US military. There's a scholarship offered by the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. Yep. So each branch offers it. They all will cover your four-year tuition, your cost of all your books, um, generally just all your costs that you come straight from the school. Yeah, you get a monthly stipend every single month, yep. so that really helps the cost of living. Uh, and you get a sign-on bonus when you join, so that really helps with moving into apartments, getting assimilated to the city, um, building up your bank account. We will note that is taxed, yeah. which is not <laughs> fun, but um, it's still a significant amount, and most people have a very forgiving tax season, so it does pay back. Um, that being said, yeah, so we were just looking for opportunities to pay mm -hmm. for school, and we just ran with it. I just quickly wanted to share, so for me, the first time I heard about this scholarship, I was actually, I don't know if you guys know DECA, but it's like the organization in high school that's like a business competition. Yeah. Oh. So we had a national conference when I was a senior in high school, and that's when I first went to like the, uh, the little booth they had set up, and they were telling me about it. But at the time, I mean, I was planning on going to university in Canada, and like I was, I didn't really, like, it wasn't really at the front of my mind. But then four years later, uh, when I was applying for dental schools, I actually got an email from a recruiter. Um, mm -hmm. And so like it wasn't like... Like, it was definitely something I was interested in and I wanted to do, but I had no idea about the timeline. We'll get into the timeline later. So I'm really glad the recruiter reached out to me because uh, it all worked out in the end. Um, so yeah, if you have, like, people visit your school, definitely worth talking to them. And um, before we move on to the next question, there's something you guys mentioned that I thought was important to touch on. So a lot of the times when we're applying to dental school and we're looking at what schools are going to apply to and of course if you're applying there you take a look at what their tuition cost yeah. is and that's at the most basic level but people that know a little bit more about loans and attending school they probably look at the whole cost of attendance but even then when you look at the cost of attendance it doesn't always factor well into where you're moving as far as like moving to it, okay, say I was I was going to University of Maryland, like moving to Baltimore instead of moving to Boston. Like the cost of living is different, very much different. And also, like you mentioned, the sign-on bonus for things like moving in, like you don't even think about that when you think about okay, I'm about to 
sign a lease where I pay maybe 1600 a month in rent. So when you're coming up here, you're like, okay, I need like maybe two or three months of rent saved up. But like, you don't think about like the $700 it costs for the U-Haul or the probably around like $2,000 worth of furniture you have to buy if you're not moving anything with you. So it's important that you guys touched on the signing bonus and like really how it helps fund not only dental school, but like living while you're in dental school and like moving to dental school, stuff like that. So uh, the second question we wanted to, I wanted to ask was, what are the commitments of the scholarship in regards to um, how much time you have to serve and, and also like what branch did you choose to join? I can, I can start that. So we all chose the Navy. Um, the basic commitment of the scholarship is that you go to school for four years. Um, so if we have the four year scholarship like we do, you go to school for four years and then you owe four years of active duty in return. Um, after that is followed by four years of uh, reserve duty. Um, so you could maybe get into that a bit if we want to. But um, just quickly, there's also three year scholarships as well. I, I don't know what the situation is for the different branches. I think it's pretty popular in the Air Force. Um, but so for example, if you do a three year scholarship, then you have three years of active duty after you graduate. Um, so basically just one year um, of active duty per one year of um, School. Or school. Like, yeah. Payback, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, and that being said, um, during your time actually in dental school, you have almost, at least for the Navy, yeah. no obligations towards them, time-wise, duty-wise. Um, you are technically a member in the reserves. We all swore our oath, mm -hmm. and uh, we're all commissioned as ensigns right now. But that being said, there is a one-time thing that you have to do called ODS, Officer Designation School, that for the Navy is in Newport, Rhode Island. And that is a five, six week, yeah, 45 days, yeah. 45 day training period where uh, that's typically done after graduation from dental school between graduation and the start of your active duty. Where you're gonna go and you're gonna learn the naval culture, uh, pretty much just like learn ranks, just the day to day life and like what to expect going into your new career because we haven't had any contact with that during our time in dental school. So it's really to acclimate you to your career. So other than just like constant email communication back and forth, well like, at the very beginning, there's constant communication back and forth, but then it's just sporadic emails, like sending in your um, academic, um, you have to send in like your financial report every yeah. year. J just a list of expenses yeah. so they know um, what, to, uh, what to pay the school. Mm -hmm. Also, there's certain things that they will cover. For instance, I believe the Army and the Navy both cover laptop rental we all, for $500 a, uh, a year. We all hopped on that. Yeah, we all hopped on that. Yeah, and uh, pretty much it'll just felt like a cost, cost sheet. You pay, out, you pay that out of pocket at first and you send in the cost sheet and then they will reimburse you once they process that paperwork. Uh, it usually takes a couple weeks. That being said, uh, it has allevi alleviated a lot of the financial burden that I think a lot of dental students face. Mm -hmm. And it definitely does, I feel, at least personally, help me focus more on my academics knowing that I am at least financially cared for, for the most part, which cool. is a great peace of mind to have. Absolutely. And they're not trying to get a lot out of you during your time in school. They, they want you to succeed. They don't want to burden you with extra responsibilities, um, duty, things like that. So they want you focused on your school. They want you becoming the best dentist you can be. And that's what you should do when you're in. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys know about the other two branches, but if you could touch on I don't know if you guys know the commitments while you're in school change or after school are very are different like in any way between Army, Navy and Air Force or anything like is there any like any specific reason why you chose Navy or well, I mean I can get into the reason why I chose Navy okay. briefly first um, so my stepdad was in the Navy okay. so I have that family connection and so I just feel like that was pretty cool for me and to talk to him about his positive experience I mean um, he really used the Navy, his time in the Navy, and his service um, to put him on a good path in life. Um, so I think that was a really great um, way to connect with that. Um, but as for the different branches, um, I mean, I, these guys can talk about, I think they applied to both uh, two different branches. Okay. Um, but in terms of commitments, I, I mean, actually, yeah, you guys should answer that because you're the ones who applied to both. Yeah, sure. So I would say the Army and the Navy are the most similar commitment-wise or at least benefits wise. Um, I'm not sure if the Air Force gives out a sign-on bonus, which is something to weigh, <laughs> definitely. But um, so for the Army and the Navy, very similar, year for year payback, same for the Air Force. But um, 
What would you say the biggest difference is even? I don't think there's a big difference between any the of benefits branches. offered are very but similar. It's it's really similar, and honestly, you should apply you should apply to as many branches as you can, because when you apply and you have to go to MEPS, uh, the medical yeah you know, medical entrance processing yes during the medical your entrance processing yeah. once you do that, and as long as you're in contact with each of the three recruiters, you're you can put in a like application through each one with that single MEPS, yeah. and you're not going to get penalized for applying to the Army, applying to the Air Force, applying to the Navy. Uh, they each have their own individual meeting and you're going to receive an offer from whichever one you get and you have to choose mm -hmm. and that will be around February. Yeah, so just touching on that idea of MEPS, so during the application cycle, after you've gotten in contact with a recruiter, you're going to be asked to complete MEPS, which I believe is Military Entrance Processing. That sounds yep. right. Yeah. And um, we did that here in Boston, Massachusetts. And so during that time, you're going to show up, you typically will spend a night overnight in a hotel before. Mm -hmm. Uh, all paid for by the branch you're going with and they feed you breakfast which is great but then uh, you show up and you do just a pretty much a rigorous full day of health testing so they'll check your hearing vision um, they'll be drug tested very important to pass drug test um, they'll check your joints hearing like I said uh, j just a lot of basics and that pretty much goes through the whole day just to make sure that you are physically qualified um, it's not like a physical test where you need to jump through hoops or do anything crazy. But it's, it's just an overall assessment of your health. So, I mean, MEPS, I think that was a really cool day. Uh, I didn't yeah. stay overnight like Ben did. Um, they told me to come in, I don't know, at like 4 or 5 a.m. or something, and I was there like an hour before anyone else was there, so I was just kind of sitting there. Uh, but then once I was in, it was really interesting. Um, I mean, one of the um, officers in charge, he told us, like, oh, this is a day you'll never forget, and definitely, um, I mean, it was just interesting to see the different people, talk to people, different walks of life, we're all um, coming together for the common purpose of joining the military, so, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a fun day, I mean, um, you know, took a big chunk, but uh, first time driving into the city, which was a big, was a big first for me. Uh, <laughs> Something for Boston. Yeah, it was a cool day. Yeah. Cool. Um, next, we're going to talk about what is the application process for the HPSB scholarship including things like requirements and the timeline for applying. Okay, yeah, so before even applying, it's very important to make sure you're a well-rounded student during your time in undergrad. Take time to volunteer, do extracurriculars, uh, get involved in research if you can. Pretty much anything helps. Just uh, make sure it's not somebody who kept their head down in the books the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important to show that you care about your community yep. and uh, just your fellow people. So that's very important. Um, your DAT score. That's in the matter to some extent. Um, there is no hard, fast number that they say you need to get this scholarship. They really do take a holistic approach to looking at your application. Mm -hmm. That being said, a 21 and up seems to be what works best for people who get accepted. Um, I had a 22, mm -hmm. which worked well for me. So yeah, I had we the all scholarship. Had there. Yeah, so we all had around that area, and it worked well for us. And um, so you need a decent GPA also. Same rule here. There's no hard, fast number they're going to say you need, but if they're very low, a recruiter usually won't work with you if it's yeah. that bad. So also, you're going to want to apply really early. Uh, so right when you send in your dental school application, you're going to want to start contacting recruiters. Don't wait for them to contact you because you want to get through MEPS as soon as possible. Because if anything comes up, like any complication during your medical, you're going to have to get a waiver through your doctor. And if you don't get that waiver, if something comes up, uh, you might not actually get your application in on time for the first round of boards where everyone meets the goal of your application. Uh, it's going to be a separate application from your DAT, and so after you go through MEPS, I mean from your, um, your yeah, dental, dental school application, application uh, it's, it's a separate application, so after you go through MEPS, you're going to have to write another personal statement. So the application is completely different from what you sent into dental school. Um, so what they're looking for, like Ben was saying, but they really stress leadership positions. And so if you can talk about how you're a leader in your community, um, how you were a leader for others, and how that's going to apply when you're in the military, I think that's very important to touch on in your application. And uh, also when we're applying, in the Navy at least, that we didn't have to do in the Army, we had to interview with Navy dentists. Uh, we had to go through, we had two interviews, and in each interview you ranked one through ten. And they are brutal with their feedback. Um, so be on your game. Yeah, like you'll have to either meet them, you'll probably meet them on Zoom, and you're going to have about a 45-minute conversation with them. Uh, they'll grill you with questions, and they will give completely honest feedback on whether or not they believe you fit in the Navy or not. 
you need to know why you are there. Yeah, showing up for these scholars, uh, showing up for these interviews. So it's, uh, it's very similar to your dental school interview, but uh, it's gonna be more based on the merit of why do you want to join the Navy rather than why do you want to be in dental school? Mm -hmm. And uh, they're gonna ask you a lot of things like, what are you most comfortable with? What are you looking forward to? What are you worried about? Reservations? Why? Why you want to? Will you be comfortable on a ship? Yep. Uh, they'll ask you about your leadership positions. They don't have your dental school application in front of you, so they only have the personal statement that you supplied to the Navy. And so you might have written something beautiful to dental schools, but if it's not on your application to the Navy, they're not going to know anything about it. Uh, so it's not as open file as we saw a lot of our dental school applications were. Um, they don't have access. They have access to your grades and stuff, but a lot of the times they'll literally just be asking you about why you want to join the Navy, about things that you've done in the past, mm -hmm. and they'll talk to you about your DAT scores. And something that can really reinforce your application can be letters of recommendation yep. from active or former duty uh, servicemen, um, and that can go a really long way. So uh, if your university or undergraduate institution has alumni who are involved in the military, please, please, please use them as a resource. Reach out, get in contact. It could seriously change your application. It puts you in a lot better of a position to work in these interviews. But basically, the earlier the better because you got to go through maps, the interviews, and like Iman, he, he started a little bit late, so if you could. Yeah, no, I mean, so I wanted to touch upon that. So, I mean, I don't know when the recruiter emailed me, probably in September, October. And so it was really just a sprint to get in all of this yeah. pay. Like, I mean, there's like two or three rounds of paper you have to go back and forth before you can even do MEPS. And so I was just looking at my email. I did MEPS on December 12th, or December 2nd. And I'm pretty sure like our applications were due like early December or like mid December at the latest. Yeah, so, so if anything went wrong. No, exactly. So I mean, I was pretty lucky to get it in like the last week. Like I had to do my whole like background check like that week. Like it was all a lot, but I got it in on time. And it's it's really important to be early because I mean, there's different boards, which is when they review all the applicants. And I think you're at a great advantage if you're on the first boards, which um, that deadline is in December. That's you where the majority of the scholarship is going to be awarded. Yeah. You exactly. don't have to have a, like an acceptance letter to a school either when they go over your application. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of them are looking at your application before you have all your acceptances. Mm -hmm. So it will be if you're given the scholarship and you don't end up getting to dental school. I don't think that happens often. No, ever. but I've but, heard that uh, you get you get put on the list of merit after that. Yeah. Oh. So. There is a yeah, there is a list of merit. So if you don't make the cut for the scholarship, they will put you on a list, and they'll keep you in mind if anyone decides they it's not the path for them and they don't want to do it or anything along those lines. And uh, going back to the timeline, start early. Once again, we'll touch it again. Start early. I applied in July. I started my process, and I applied to go to Meps, get cleared medically, yeah. and it turned out I had broken my right hand the year before. Uh, my fifth metatar metatarsal, and uh, it's a seemingly small bone, and it ended up stopping my paperwork dead in its tracks for about a month until I could get all the documentation from my hospital, my former surgeon, all that saying that I am medically cleared. So start early, so if any of those unforeseen obstacles show up, you can get over them. And um, you guys mentioned when the application was due, but w like when does it open? Uh, I guess around June and July? Around June and July. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's really going to be just about contacting the recruiters in your area, and it's on you to stay in contact with them and really make sure that, like Ben and I, at least, we were working with the same department. Like, we we had to make sure that we were always communicating with them because they have a lot of people applying for the scholarship. The scholarship's very competitive, and so if they don't see that you're committed to this position, uh, you might just like fall through the cracks. To be honest, one hundred percent. Because I start, I started in August, and I don't think everything was completed for me until deadline day, which was until like December fifteenth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Your recruiter is your greatest resource, yeah. but they're not there to babysit you. No, nope. they're not going to hold your hand and walk you through every step here. You, you really need to be proactive about this entire process, start to finish, and just really make sure you're keeping up with your paperwork. You're, you're going to get a flood that seems unmanageable at some points, but you just have to sit down and take the time and fill it out. Get the information, get the letter recs, get the references, get it all done, and get it in as fast as possible, because all it will do is help you secure that scholarship. And the easier you make it for your recruiter, the better your life's going to be. They will be happy with you. Yeah. So um, Iman mentioned that uh, you were interested in getting into the military because you, yeah. your stepdad was in the military. But um, I guess for you two, what, uh, what made you decide to join the military? And if, 
before you had the information about it and you were kind of maybe on the fence or maybe not sure like what you were getting into, how did you go about getting just more information about the military and kind of what you were getting into by applying to the scholarship? Totally. Um, so I come from a family that has a military background, definitely. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was in Vietnam, my cousin was in Iraq, so I always grew up around people who had served. Mm -hmm. um, I was always engaged in my community. Mm -hmm. I'm an Eagle Scout. Um, I was involved during my time in undergrad with a lot of nonprofit organizations, one run by Liam, yeah. um, which was great. And um, so I always had this desire to serve my community, and I wanted to be part of something greater. And I really think that the message of the military um, was something that spoke to me a lot just because it appealed to people who want to be something greater than themselves and want to be part of something that helps the world become a better place. And it's like a force for good. Mm. Yeah, I've heard that in the recruitment ads. I, know. Um, I really think joining the military is a very noble cause. Uh, I mean, I did have some military background. My grandpa was very involved with the Korean War veterans. He was in the Air Force. And my uh, late great uncle, he was in the Navy and he was like, everything to my grandma and uh, when she passed I, before she passed I told her that I was thinking about the scholarship and she she really wanted me to she really thought of me in the same light as her brother and so I wanted to kind of emulate who he was as a person uh, by applying for the scholarship but I really want to emphasize that I think it's a noble cause to serve your country and also we're gonna look pretty sharp in those uniforms yeah the <laughs> uniforms look good um, but you're you're not like you're not, you're not gonna go into combat I think that's something that a lot of people worry about. Because I know my mom personally, she was very much against me applying for the military scholarship when she knew nothing about it. And to be honest, until I started researching it more and more, uh, I realized that you're really, you're a part of a dental professional team in the military. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be in combat. Uh, you're going to be stationed at bases that can be like in Balt in Maryland, in Richmond, Virginia, Illinois, can be on the west coast in California bases in Hawaii, there's bases in Italy, and then uh, we know we know a Navy dentist, she's in Bahrain right now, and she's having a blast. Um, yeah, actually I was going to shout her out too, um, so there's Dr. Monica Lee on YouTube, yep. so that's, when I was considering this scholarship, um, I just wanted to go online and find any information mm -hmm. I could, and so she has a YouTube channel there where I was watching her videos, and I actually reached out to her and had a conversation with her, which was pretty cool, um, so I know she's done interviews. Um, and you can just watch her videos, look her up, and look up just in general like Navy Dentist on YouTube online, um, on the SDN forums. I actually spent like half a day, and there's like 60 pages like Ask a Navy Dentist, so I just like, all right, just scroll through for a couple hours and just learn everything I could. Totally. Um, so th there is information out there, it's kind of hard to get, but another great resource is, um, you know, if you go through and you do your actual interviews. Um, so we talked to Navy dentists and we did our mm -hmm. interviews and so I mean I know I talked to one Navy orthodontist who went to school here at Tufts and um, so I mean you have those people's information as well so um, there's definitely resources available for you to talk to people and to get a sense of whether it's right for you um, yeah cool and um, I'm gonna make sure I link literally all the resources that these guys have in the description of the video so please feel free to reach out all. yeah for sure all right so um, we just finished up talking about uh, the requirements for applying to the scholarship and uh, kind of what, what made them want to join the military. So I wanted to kind of flow that question into what type of people would you recommend uh, for joining the military? And like what kind of traits do people usually have that consider joining the military that are kind of things that match in both, you know, the real world and making a good fit for the military. Yeah, definitely. So, like we said earlier, they're looking for people who have held leadership positions or are leaders. They, uh, they really know how to take charge and not only be a leader, but also be part of a great, greater team. So, um, yeah. in the military, you're going to be an officer. You're going to be in charge of people. You're commissioned as a 01 once you finish dental school. Oh, you're coming to 03. 03, okay. So, it's 03 after dental school. And uh, you'll be part of a bigger team. It's going to be your job to take care of the people under you, take care of the orders that are passed down from people over you, so uh, you have to be able to communicate mm -hmm. effectively. Yeah, I think, I think all walks of life can really take advantage of these scholarships, uh, especially people who I think are community service oriented would especially benefit from this because like, they would have those leadership experiences. And like the Navy, the Navy, Army, Air Force, they all treat very diverse patient populations. And so uh, people have experience with like 
with the community service going out into the community and interacting with all sorts of different people, uh, they're really going to thrive in the military environment, I think. Because mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not very cookie cutter. It's like you're going to be dealing with the probably most diverse patient population out there. Yeah, and th that's an important thing to note too. So someone who's w interested in working with that patient population, yeah. so our men and women of the armed forces, and uh, that's something that really drew me to the scholarship just based off the fact that I'm going to be able to work with people who keep our country safe, who help uplift others and protect freedom around the world. So that's pretty great to be able to uh, be their dentist. And I believe we all those dentists also go out to the community and they help those. I think they often do too. Yeah, there's uh, some outreach programs, I believe, through the military, right. depending on where you're stationed and how things are. Yeah, I mean, there's the one ship, the USS Mercy. I don't know if you've heard about yeah. that one. Yes. So, I mean, they travel the world on humanitarian missions as well. So that's definitely an opportunity that I hope that comes up because that would be cool to be mm -hmm. part of. Um, Certainly. Another thing I would say, another um, trait, I think, like, you guys mentioned working with people both above and below. Um, a lot of the Navy dentists I talked to during my interview mentioned, like, camaraderie is a big thing about why they love um, the Navy. So, I mean, yeah. I think that experience, um, you know, there will be some days tougher than others, but you're with a group of people that are all like-minded and working hard, so I think your ability to work in a team, like they mentioned, I think um, is a great quality to have. Um, and to be flexible as well, because obviously, um, you know, we're serving in the military, so sometimes maybe we don't get our top choices on certain things, um, but at the end of the day, um, if you have a good attitude and you can always bounce back, I think uh, that's a good trait to have as well. Yeah. Physical fitness is important to some extent. Yeah. There is a definitely a physical aspect mm -hmm. to the career. Um, PT is going to be a normal thing once you get into the actual Navy. So, and there's a PT test, I believe. Yes, in, uh, during ODS, and then you have to keep it up throughout the years. But so. I know it's a 1.5 mile run. You have to do push ups, sit ups, rowing, uh, chin ups, and pull ups, and they're going to test you on that. I, the requirements are pretty baseline, and you only have to reach like the very minimum requirements, but you still have to be in some kind of I mean, Liam's running a half marathon tomorrow, so I think yeah. he'll be all set, but some of us probably have a little bit of work to get into it. <laughs> and it motivates you to get into it. I, I wasn't running before that, but now I'm all yeah, it. Yeah. But um, that's not something you should super stress about, but do no. keep yourself f physically healthy. Stay away from drugs, alcohol, anything along those lines. Live but, a clean um, life. Live a clean life, <laughs> yeah. All right, so last question before we finish up. This is the hot topic among scholarships. Does the scholarship affect your ability to specialize and or do a residency? So I can start with that. So the typical path from what I've heard, and it's not the exclusive path, but from what I've heard the expectation is once you graduate, mm -hmm. um, you have an option of either doing a, G, G, or a GPR or AEGD, which is like the one year residency, or you do what's called a credentialing tour. Um, which is very similar to those residencies, but it's not an actual residency. It's just one year to get up to speed within the Navy. Mm -hmm. So that's your first year into the scholarship. And then after that, um, typically, if you're interested in specializing, I think it's advantageous to have that one year residency first, and then in your subsequent years, you can apply um, for those residencies. I know like certain residencies are much greater need in the military. For example, like oral surgery is a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, and then conversely, because there are less children in the military, just like the families of um, service members, um, like pediatrics and orthodontics probably have less slots, but they still exist. I mean, like I said, I've talked to a couple of Navy orthodontists, so those slots exist, but they're just less uh, prevalent. Um, that being said, I think that's like the typical path, but I mean, I've heard of stories of people expediting that, so I think it really, I mean, you know, it's our first year, so hopefully we'll yeah. find out more about that as it goes along. That being said, during your, I don't think the time during your AEGD counts as payback for you. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 So there is that period, but it doesn't add more time. Right. So you are getting like, that extra experience, which is really great, but it's not tacking on more time that you're going to owe, but it's also not paying back that time you were in dental school. But once again, if you look at the grand scheme and the numbers and everything, it's the best deal you could possibly get. And uh, that little bit of time that you're spending your AEGD yeah. is only going to help you in your career further. And also when it comes to specializing through the Navy, those years that you do, if you were to specialize in the Navy and stay in longer than your four-year contract, um, those years during schooling also end up accruing payback years. So if you decide to do a three-year residency orthodontics to the Navy or any specialty that they offer you, um, you end up owing those years back also. But, but you don't end up in more debt. Yeah. Right. There's, there's 
positives and negatives to each decision you make. Uh, the one thing the recruiters always told us was that um, you're like the highest paid residence like ever because you're getting like your full dentist salary as you're doing your residency. So normally if you're paying or getting a small stipend to do your residency, instead you're actually getting paid just like our normal dentist salary. So that's one plus. Yeah. Um, but I know people, you know, there's a bunch of different paths you can take. Obviously you could specialize within the Navy or once you separate you can pursue that later. So. I mean, all, all kinds of options that are available, which is cool. Yeah, and, and totally. I've heard there's some confusion, but um, once you start serving your active duty time, you, you get paid. A lot of people think that you're supposed to be working for free or something because you've gotten your school paid for, but no, there, there's a salary that you're being paid as you're an officer, and there's bonuses on top, because I believe there's like a medical bonus or something mm -hmm. for being a medical professional. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a significant six-figure starting salary in the Navy for your four years, mm -hmm. which is uh, excellent. And if you really want to get through the Navy as quick or the military branch as quickly as possible, uh, we touched on the credentialing tour. That actually does count towards your four years. So if you don't do an AGD or a G GRP, uh, GPR, uh, you can just go through the credentialing core tour, and you only serve three years after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of options. Yeah. <laughs> it, you, you can take it as you want it. Mm -hmm. it there, there's a lot of flexibility to pursue whatever career you want. A lot of people are going to want to be lifers. A lot of yeah. people are going to get into the Navy. They're going to love the security, the camaraderie, and being part of a larger team and be able to travel around the world and see bases and mm -hmm. live that life. And um, a lot of people are going to want to stay in. And then some people are not going to be a huge fan of the lifestyle, and they're going to get out after four years and yeah. pursue whatever they want. So people will even come back. One of my interviewers did that. So mm -hmm. it's really up to you and what you want. That's what you put into it. Certainly. Yeah. Cool. It's awesome. All right. So. That wraps up the video. Um, I don't know if there's any anything you guys want to add, um, you know, that may not have been part of a question, but you feel is necessary to mention in regards to the scholarship or anything before we close out. Feel free. Well, I know we all became best friends because we have the scholarship. <laughs> yeah. So honestly, if you go if you're going to a whole new school and you don't know anyone there, you can connect to the HPSP kids. I, I've been hanging out at the medical school. I hang out with the kid who's in the Air Force there. Anytime I run into a Navy dentist, Army dentist, all of a sudden the camaraderie's there. Yeah, it's, I think it attracts a certain type of person. Yeah. Scholarship, definitely. Someone who has the willingness to serve, as we talked on uh, earlier, and just, it, it's, it's this great community that I already feel like I'm part of. Yeah, it's a, it's a really small world. Like. Yeah, it's a very small world. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we're just starting, so I'm really excited to see what the future holds. Um, but yeah, like one thing I would say, like the, like these guys did, like I didn't do, apply as early as you can if you're interested, <laughs> so you don't have to do all that headache uh, right at the end there. But um, yeah, definitely worth it. And um, like we said earlier a little bit too, um, a lot of you guys have anxiety about being in the military and the risks that come with that. Yes, there is inherent risk to being in the military, but you have to think of it like this. You are a million dollar, practically, investment made by the military in your education, in your, your salary, in all the credentialing they do for you, um, they aren't going to send you to a front line, typically. It's not going to happen. So uh, have faith. Understand that there's some risk, but um, the rewards are immense to be debt-free and to be able to get out of that. If you look at the numbers of p years it takes to pay back average dental salary now, it's kind of intimidating. So it's nice to be able to do four years and yeah have the freedom financially to do whatever you want. If you stay in the Navy, I could decide I never want to practice dentistry again. And I don't have the debt, and I can wash my hands of it and be done. So what is the best way to reach you guys specifically, um, which I'll also link in the description, but you can just mention an email or uh, social media page yeah. if you want. Yeah, I'll just do so. My name's Iman, I-M-A-N-Z, as in zebra at bu.edu, so I'll answer any email, happy to. Cool, yeah, you can reach out to me at bnbell at bu.edu, and also, uh, should be linking my Instagram or something, yeah. Instagram and emails on the feed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and you can reach me at ljshie at bu.edu. Cool. Awesome. All right, so that's it. I appreciate everyone for watching the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel like the video and of course if you have questions you can still leave a comment I'll definitely get the questions to them um, and we will get you answers but um, I'll link a way to reach out to every one of them thank you guys all three of you for doing this video 
because as busy as we are, it is hard to film videos and definitely hard to get three, plus me, so three other dental students that are super busy people <laughs> to get together at one time to film a video. So thanks, thanks for having us. us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Having us. Yeah. Cool. So see you guys in the next one. Peace. Nice. <laughs> I love it.